Hi Church, welcome to our English service uh, this weekend. And just as a quick recap, we want to just uh, once again remind us of the different uh, streaming of our services taking place on YouTube. On Saturday, we have our Hokkien services streaming at 3 p.m. On Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Uh, English service. And then again on Sunday, 9 a.m., we have our English service uh, streaming on YouTube. And then finally, 11.30 a.m. will be our Chinese services. Well, just a quick reminder to all of us as well that uh, this weekend we are observing and participating of the Lord's Supper together. So if for some reason you have forgotten to prepare the elements, uh, do go ahead and prepare the elements so that we can participate in our Lord's Supper as a family of God together in our time of worship. So as we just prepare ourselves right now you know, for our time of entering into the presence of God, I'm going to hand this time over to our worship team to lead us in a time of worship. So over to you, worship team. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. And you know, the Lord has just been bringing me back to Psalm 84 the entire week. And I thought before we begin our time, let's just go on straight to read the, the, the whole passage together. And, and we're going to put it up on the screen. So wherever you are, why don't you just go ahead and come and read together with us, okay? So Psalms 84 verse 1, it says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows fever, favor, not fever. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, Blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. Amen. You know, indeed, we are blessed when we come and trust and believe in the Lord. So today, we are going to come and worship God in this position of being the blessed one. Amen. Amen. We are the blessed Amen. ones. Amen. Yes, so we're going to come together and declare that indeed, God, you are alive in us. Amen. Was lost with a broken heart. You picked me up, now I'm set apart. From the ash, I'm born again. Forever safe in the Savior's hands. And you are more than my words could say. I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days. And fix my eyes, following your ways. Forever free in unending grace. You are, you are, you are my freedom. We lift you higher, lift you higher. Your love, your love, your love never ending. Oh, oh, wow. You are alive in us. Nothing can take your place. You are all we need. Your love has set us free. with us and in the midst of the darkest night yes lord and let your love be the shining light and breaking chains that were holding me you sent your son down and set me free because everything of this world will fade i'm pressing on till i see your face and i will live that you will be done Stop till your kingdom come Cause you are, you are Your love is set 
Lord, indeed, we can come and praise you because you are a good and you're a faithful God. And Lord, today, we just want to give you all the praise and all the worship. Whatever season, whatever situation we may be, Lord, there's always a reason to come and praise you. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Invading all my weakness And you wrap me up in grace Worst of me succeeded by the best of you. Hey! So, whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. And my heart is overtaken and my soul is overwhelmed. Worst of me succeed by the best of you. My dreams have found their purpose, my future in your hands. And this life would have no meaning if it weren't for you. So I lay me down for kingdom come. This world is more of you In the less of me it is you Increasing as I fade away Your light for all the world to see Hey, hey, hey God it is you Who breaks the chains It is you who lights the way And everything I am cries out for you transparent your life and mind displayed and let every earthly glory go back to you that's right so i lay me down for kingdom come still all that is within me because all i want of this world is more of you in the last of me, it is you Increasing as I fade away Your light for all the world to see Hey, hey, hey God, it is you Who breaks the chains, it is you Who lights the way in everything I am Cries out for you We sing kingdom come still all that is within me cause all I want of this world is more of you 
in the less of me it is you increasing as I fade away your light for all the world to see hey 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 God it is you who breaks the chains it is you who lights the way in everything I am cries out for you Why don't you just close your eyes right now and let's just take a moment to come before the Lord and, and begin to thank Him. Thank Him for how your week has been. Thank Him for the many, many blessings that He has given unto you. Bless His name and thank Him for the provisions that we have in our life right now. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship His holy name, and sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Your rich in love and your slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is Kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. So bless the Lord of oh my soul. holy name and sing like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name and all that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come and still my soul will sing your praise unending 
Ten thousand years and then forevermore, forevermore. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship His holy. God in Habakkuk 3.17 reminds us that although the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes in the vines still I will bless the Lord I will praise His holy name Lord Jesus we pray right now for your Holy Spirit to just come and just touch everyone who is watching right now Lord for whatever reasons Lord that we find it hard, but yet, God, we choose, we decide to bless your holy name. And as we do that, God, we know, Father God, you come and just touch and minister to every one of us, Lord. So just lift up your hearts right now. Lift up your praise to Him. Bless His holy name. Bless His holy name. Bless His holy name And as we worship You, Lord You touch us, Lord Yes, we worship Your holy name Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name. Yes, we'll sing, sing like never before. Yes, Lord, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship Your holy name Beautiful name it is The name of 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a powerful name. What a beautiful name. The name of Jesus. You know, I can really, really sense God's presence as the worship team was just leading us in this song. The name of Jesus is powerful. The name of Jesus is beautiful. There's no other name but the name of Jesus. And you know, the name of Jesus is the very name that brings to us salvation. It's the very name that gives to our lives just hope and joy and peace. Well, brothers and sisters, wherever you're watching this service from this weekend, we have come to a very, very special moment in our time together. Why don't we just quieten our hearts wherever we are watching this? And this weekend, we have come to remember the Lord through the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And just go ahead and get your elements ready as we prepare our hearts for this time. And as our hearts are quietened down, take a moment to remember the name of Jesus. Take a moment to remember the goodness and the grace of God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just want to welcome you into wherever we are watching this service. As we prepare our hearts, Lord, to remember you, we pray that your presence will come. Fill our homes, fill our rooms, fill the very places where we are gathered this weekend. You know, church, the Bible tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took bread, and after He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Why don't we just take a moment right now to prepare our hearts to partake of the bread together. The bread that reminds us of the body of Christ that is broken for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's partake of the bread together in remembrance of the body of Christ that was given for us. Bible tells us in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The cup reminds us of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Take a moment right now to remember His blood that was shed for us. And let's partake of the cup together. Lord Jesus, we come this weekend in remembrance of you. Thank you for your body that was broken for us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all our sins. Lord, we are just so grateful, we are just so thankful that we can be your people, that we can be your sons and daughters, that we become the family of God that belongs to Christ. We thank you, Lord. Bless you. And Lord, we pray that our hearts will always constantly remember all that you have done for us and we will not forget your goodness towards us. We thank you, Lord. We bless you. In your name we pray. And wherever you are, just go ahead and say, Amen, Amen. Let's just declare this one more time. The power, the goodness, the beauty of the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Since death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, silenced above. Of sin and rain, the heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. Amen. And you have no rival, you have no equal. 
can stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Praise God, praise God. What a powerful name. What a beautiful name. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, we just want to enter a time where we just use this opportunity as we are just soaking in the presence of God, as we are just enjoying the presence of God. We want to use this opportunity to take some time to begin to pray. And we want to just begin to intercede and, and apply the name of Jesus, the power of the name of Jesus over some prayer items that, that I, I felt the Lord leading us to pray for this weekend. So for, firstly, we definitely need to pray for the crisis, the situation in Myanmar. So right now, wherever you are, you know, today's papers all over the papers, or uh, Saturday's papers, all over the papers is about Myanmar and the situation there. And we need to pray for, for Myanmar. We need to pray for not just the political situation in Myanmar, but we need to pray for the spiritual condition of Myanmar. We need to pray that the people of Myanmar will come to Jesus. So wherever we are right now, at the count of three, if you are with others uh, in, in the home where you are watching, just join our hearts together at a count of three and begin to intercede uh, for Myanmar, begin to pray for Myanmar. All right, let's do that right now at the count of three. One, two, three. Come, let's begin to pray right now. Let's begin to intercede right now. Let's begin to apply the name of Jesus over the nation of, of, of Myanmar. Begin to visualize the people there. Begin to see the scenes that we have watched in the news or in the newspapers. Begin to apply the power of the name of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus. We do not uh, exactly understand what are the political complications or, or situations but we know that we can have power through the name of Jesus and the Lord can change the situation that the spiritual atmosphere over Myanmar can change this weekend as we pray as we apply the name of Jesus things can begin to change right now because God loves Myanmar and He wants to touch the people of Myanmar He wants to bring peace upon this land so just begin to press on for about 20 more seconds begin to pray uh, for the political situation begin to pray for just a calm and, and peace to come upon the land just begin to take authority over violence begin to take authority over just senseless uh, uh, killing and, and military action Action that is just attacking uh, the people there. Let's begin to intercede right now. Shikala bahara ba, shikala bahara ba, hara ba hala ba. Oh, rakata kala ba, santa la ba, hara kata kala ba, shikata kala ba, hala ba, hala ba, hala ba, hala ba. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we want to thank you that you love this nation of Myanmar. And Father, we just want to pray and intercede right now and apply the name of Jesus over Myanmar. We pray that the blood of Jesus will begin to cleanse this land. We pray that the blood of Jesus will begin to bring salvation and shalom and peace upon this land. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over every spirit of violence. We take authority over every spirit of chaos. And we say that you must stop right now in the name of of Jesus and as God's church as God's people we begin to pray and we ask that the situation will begin to change and we apply the name of Jesus by faith that in this next couple of days as, as we have prayed as your people we will see changes take place in the situation we will see peace and resolution come upon that land we thank you Lord we bless you Lord we pray this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We just want to pray for one more item and many of us know that for us right here in Singapore right now, we are just going through the COVID-19 uh, vaccination exercise and things are taking place in a very orderly manner. Many, many people are receiving the notice for the vaccination. So we just want to take uh, just a minute or so to be begin to pray that as Singapore goes through the vaccination exercise, the Lord will watch over our land. That the, as, as people in different estates, in different communities begin to take their vac vaccination, we want to pray for the protection of the Lord over us. All right. So right now, wherever you are at the count of three, begin to ask for God's protection over Singapore as we take the vaccination and as, as everything will be done in an orderly manner that our people will be protected from any complications. Okay, so let's begin to pray right now. One, two, three. Just begin to intercede right now. 
Father, we just want to lift up, Lord, the vaccination exercise in Singapore right now before you. Father, we just want to pray and ask that your, your hand of, of grace, your hand of protection, your hand of orderliness will even come upon uh, Singapore as we go through the vaccination exercise. We're going to ask for the elderly, the, the, those who are more vulnerable, that Lord, you protect us, you watch over us, and you cover us, Lord, that everything will be done in the orderly manner. We pray that our people will not just... Uh, or into any form of serious complication. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just want to lift up Singapore before you. We want to thank you for your grace and your mercies that have been upon our land so much so far right now. And Lord, we just want to ask that even as we go through the vaccination exercise for the entire population of Singapore, Father, we cry out to you once again for your protection. We ask for the elderly, those who are vulnerable, those who are taking the vaccination to be covered with the blood of Jesus, that Lord, we will be protected from any forms of complication. And we ask and lift up the authorities before you that as they execute the uh, exercise of the vaccination, give to them wisdom, give to them good organisation. And we ask for all the med medical workers as well to be protected, to be kept safe as we go through this exercise. So we lift up Singapore before you. We thank you, Lord. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. And wherever you are, whoever you are with, go ahead and say Amen and Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Well, it is just so beautiful to be able to come into God's presence uh, together this weekend to worship the Lord, to partake of the Lord's Supper, and even just to pray. And I could sense the, the unity in our, in our spirit even as we are praying together this weekend. Well, we come to a very important time in our uh, worship together and this is not just another part of the program, but this is part of our worship. So we want to prepare our hearts to give to the Lord our tithes and offering. And just as you have heard every uh, week, and we want to just emphasize once again, this is how you can give. And uh, you can basically give online, all right, at fcbc.org.sg slash offering. And this online link uh, will be there throughout the week at all times and you can log on anytime to give of your tithes and offering to the Lord. And of course, alternatively, you can right now, this very moment, scan the PayNow QR codes that are shown on the screen right now. And the red box on your left is for our regular tithes and offering. And the blue box on the right side, that QR code on the right side, is for our missions, faith, pleasures. And once again, as a quick reminder, you do need to use your uh, banking apps uh, mobile apps to scan those QR code. All right, it's not just a regular uh, QR scanner. You need to use the uh, banking apps QR code to scan in order to give of your tithes and offering to the Lord. So the Lord bless you. The Lord reward you greatly. The Lord just multiply your life and your giving. Okay, as you give to the Lord uh, this weekend and even any time throughout the week you want to give to the Lord, please feel free to do so. Well, I just have a couple of quick announcements for us before we uh, hear the Word of God together this weekend. Firstly, conversational Japanese language course, all right? And I think we have mentioned this last weekend. Our missions department is organizing a conversational Jap uh, a Japanese language course. And this is for all FCBC members who want to reach out to uh, Japanese people, whether locally or abroad, and you'd like to pick up this language, okay? So there'll be a total of 10 lessons that will be conducted uh, online through Zoom from the 6th of April to the 8th of April. And the course fee is, uh, I believe, is, is affordable and reasonable, $50, and it includes a textbook, okay? So to register for this uh, Japanese language course so that you can reach out to this group of people, and we want to encourage many young people, many young adults to join as well, well, to register, you need to email our missions staff at the email address that is shown on your screen right now. And you need to do so quickly, okay, basically by next Sunday, the 14th of March. The 14th of March. And if you do require more information, please uh, visit this link here, fcbc.org.sg slash announcements. So the first announcement is about conversational Jap uh, Japanese language course. Secondly... The second announcement is about leaders meeting, all right? Leaders meeting, and we want to inform all leaders that will be uh, that we would like to meet you online on the 17th of March, which uh, which is a Wednesday, and it will take place uh, 
from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Okay, and this leaders' meeting will be hosted on YouTube and the link will be circulated through your team pastors closer to the date of the leaders' meeting. And for our leaders who are Mandarin uh, speaking, just know that Mandarin interpretation will be provided, uh, which we have been doing uh, as usual. All right? And once again, if you do need more information, you can find Announce uh, details about these announcements from our fcbc.org.sg slash announcements website. All right. Well, before I start the sermon, just a quick reminder to families who have children that are watching uh, this weekend's service. If you are using a smart TV or some other devices to watch, uh, you know this this uh, this weekend's uh, service, turn on the live chat, and our hardworking G Kids. Volunteers and staff will be engaging the children all right, uh, with live comments during the sermon so that they can engage and participate in understanding the messages uh, that are coming out through this weekend's sermon. Okay, so turn on the live chat so that they can be involved. Okay, praise the Lord, praise God. Well, church, it's just so great to be bringing you the Word of God uh, this weekend. And, you know, this weekend I just felt a prompting in my heart as I, as I just was entering the, the new year and I was just spending time praying and re reflecting uh, as we cross into the new year, I, re I realized, I'm not sure whether you, you realize or noti notice, there are quite a number of events that have taken place since the start of 2021. And we are right into almost just about three months into the new year, and there are already quite a number of what I call world-shaking events taking place. Now, what are, what are some of the examples of these events? For example, you know, in January, there was the change of the American presidency. And some of you know that with that, you know, it could bring about high chance, okay? It will bring about a shift in policies that will shape spiritual and the moral climate around us. There are the ongoing political crisis in Myanmar, which we spent time praying for just now. As we enter the new year, as we, as we cross in the new year, there were extreme climatic and environmental disasters, right? Like snowstorms, floodings, and earthquakes, you know? When I, when I was writing this sermon uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, I didn't realize that as, as I wrote it, and, and some of you know that yesterday there were even earthquakes taking place, all right? And, and all these, all these what I call world-shaking events are taking place right in the midst of still that long-drawn battle against COVID-19. Now, perhaps as we cross into this new year and we look at some of these situations that are happening, maybe some of us, we feel shaken. Maybe some of us, we feel saddened and, 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 and by things that are happening. And of course, recently, many of us in the Christian world, we, we have been affected by negative reports from an international Christian ministry and, and, and those reports that came out affected our Christian witness uh, quite badly all around the world. And, and some of us may feel saddened, we may feel shocked, we may feel even disillusioned. But I want to say this to us, you know, regardless of what we see happening around us, while it's understandable that some of us feel saddened, some of us feel shaken, yet, church, listen to this, we must not feel surprise as God's people. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26, the Bible tells us, at this time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. So God says that there will be times of shaking and everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Everything that you and I hold on so tightly will be shaken, will be tested, and only that which is truly of God will remain. And we need to understand that as God's people, we need to understand as the church of God that even God's church, even God's people are not exempted from these shakings. And whatever we see is happening around the world today, is basically confirming for us that what God said will happen is happening. And it's like alarm, alarms sounding for us, okay, sounding out for us, that as these shakings take place, there are alarms sounding out for us that it's time that we examine the foundations of our Christian lives, that even though we may feel shaken or shocked by what is happening, 
we need to rise above those feelings because God is shaking so that our foundations can be checked so that we can, we can look into our lives and, and see, hey, you know, is my life living in accordance to God's will or is there something missing in my life? So with that background of, of, of what I've been sensing, well, I'm bringing you this weekend's uh, sermon. And this weekend's sermon is titled, Rejecting Compromise. Rejecting Compromise. And I sense that God wants to speak to us regarding compromise. And, and the last couple of weeks, the Lord had been uh, leading senior pastors to talk to us about dealing with uh, sin, dealing with the situations of our own uh, spiritual conditions. And, I, and, I, and as a follow-through, I'm, I, I just sense the Lord wanting to speak to us this weekend about rejecting compromise. So let's read from Revelation uh, chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. And we're going to learn together what God is saying to us about compromise. All right. Revelation 2, verses 12 to 17. And the Word of God says, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Verse 14. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold on to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. And I pray for us, you know, this weekend the Lord will speak to us through His Word. Now, the verses that we have just read comes from what we call one of the seven letters to the uh, one of the letters to the seven churches from the book of Revelation, and it's a, it's a very very important letter, and it's one of the letters to the seven churches. And the book of Revelation, you know, pastor and teacher Jack Hayford says this: the book of Revelation is a newspaper of tomorrow and a handbook for living today. Now, some of us know that. Revelation is kind of like a prophetic book, but Revelation does not just point us to the future. It is a newspaper of tomorrow, but Revelation also points us to how we should live in the present. It is a handbook for today. And the letters to the seven churches are important for us to read and understand because these words to the seven churches are spoken by Jesus, oftentimes in the first person, addressing the spiritual conditions of God's people that needs to be dealt with so that they are ready for the coming of the Lord. The prophecies and warnings given in the book of Revelation are for our honest self-examination. And as we read through these letters, as we read through the Word of God recorded for us in Revelation, we come to a point where we need to ask ourselves, is my life spiritually complete <clears throat> or is my life falling short when Jesus comes? Is my life spiritually complete or is it falling short when Jesus comes? So, understand that. All right, And we want to look at the first few verses that we have just read to establish some context for us as we learn together from the verses that we have just read. So we're going to look at the first few verses and we look at verses 12 to 14, which I just read to you a moment ago. And it says this, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, and 
who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. And in verse 14, Jesus says these words, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Now, Bible and historical records point us to the fact that this church, Pergamum, is very interesting, okay? This church, Pergamum, is not a weak church, okay? It's not a weak church. In fact, it was a church, as the scripture records for us, that is right in the thick of spiritual warfare and battle. Pergamon was a church confronting the forces of, of darkness where Satan had his throne. And not only that, in Pergamon, they were, they were well known because of this believer called Antipas who was put to death for his faith and, and according to historical records, he was burned. In fact, some records put it that he was actually bought alive for his faith. Again, okay? he was bought alive to death for his faith. And so Pergamon was a church known for standing up against spiritual persecution and severe persecution. Now, what is interesting here as, as a context for us to understand is that while Jesus affirmed their bold witness, while Jesus affirmed that despite the life-threatening persecutions that they were going through, Yet, our Lord Jesus Christ had specific spiritual issues raised again this church. Issues that to the Lord, if it was not severely and seriously dealt with, would one day render their faithful witness ineffective. Basically, the church of Pergamum was living in spiritual compromises. And it was living in spiritual compromises that it had to wake, wake up to, okay? And Jesus had to wake them up to the spiritual compromises that they were living, living with. Now, what do we mean when we talk about spiritual compromise? What does spiritual compromise mean? Spiritual compromise basically is accepting a lower, a lower moral or spiritual standard to live by that lessens or deadens our spiritual effectiveness. So when we say that we are compromising and compromising spiritually, it is living a lower standard, okay, of what we are supposed to be living uh, at. It is accepting that and it's living by a lower standard that affects our spiritual effectiveness. So while Pergamum was a tough church in the midst of persecution. Jesus was very, very concerned for this church and they needed to wake up and understand that compromise was not a small issue because, listen to this, little compromises in the church of Pergamum, little compromises in our, in our lives, in our spiritual lives, will lead to deadly sins. Little compromises will lead to deadly sins. Or you can say little compromises will lead to large or big sins. So spiritual compromise was no small issue for Pergamum and Jesus had to call it out call out the issues that Pergamum was facing, call the issues that Pergamum was, was living incorrectly and the Lord had to bring specific instructions to help them get rid of spiritual compromise from the church. So this weekend's lesson has great relevance for our lives. What Jesus said and what Jesus taught the church of Pergamum has great relevance for our lives, for our spiritual conditions. It has great relevance for our t the times that we are living in. So with this background, with this context uh, in mind, with this understanding, we want to learn this weekend from God's Word. All right? How can we overcome spiritual compromise in our lives? How can we overcome spiritual compromise in our lives? Well, I have two points for you. Firstly, to overcome spiritual compromise in our lives, we must hold on to, we must hold on to God's word of truth fully. To overcome spiritual compromise in our lives, we must first 
hold on to God's word of truth fully. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, this is what Jesus said of himself. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-aged sword. And then again in verse 16, Jesus says, I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now this description of Jesus, the sword of his mouth, the double-aged sword is very, very important because it immediately reminds us of what the Word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this, For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-aged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joints and marrow, the Word of God exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now church, don't miss the tone of what Jesus was saying to the Pergamum church, okay? Now some of you, as you read this, you say, wow, pastor, Jesus fears it. Hey, is, is, was Jesus scolding the church? Listen to me. Absolutely. He was absolutely scolding the church. He was absolutely rebuking the church. He was, all right? And right here, in bringing correction to the Pergamum church, Jesus comes as the living Word of God to cut right into their compromise and deception. And Jesus was very, very specific in calling out the spirit the compromises that was caused by false teachings, the compromises that was existing in the Pergamum church. Now listen, God's word of truth is sharper than any two-edged sword and it is absolutely needed. And that's why Jesus said he had to come as a double-edged sword to speak to the church. Why? Listen to this. It is so important that, the, that God's word come like a sword because compromises basically blur the lines of God's standards. Only God's word of truth can draw the lines clearly for our lives. When you and I compromise, when you and I are so self-deceived, when you and I are so selfish in wanting to live our lives the way we want to live, what we do is we actually blur the lines of what God's Word tells us. And because we are so good at blurring the lines, we are so good at self-deceiving ourselves to fulfill our own desires, Therefore, the word of God's truth need to come strong into our lives to draw the lines clearly for us. And we see right here that Jesus called out very, very specific false teaching and beliefs. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Jesus firstly said to them, Hey, there are those of you in the church among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Right? And then in verse 15, he says, Then there are also those of you who hold on to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So Jesus was very specific of the false teaching that they were holding on to. Now let's understand what were these false teachings are all about. Firstly, Balaam, right? So in Balaam, which was the, the whole record, uh, the whole story of Balaam was found in the book of Numbers. And basically, Balaam got more bite women to entice the young men of Israel. Okay, so the Moabite were not the people of Israel, they were idolatrous people. And, 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 and Balaam basically got these uh, Moabite women to entice the young men of Israel and got them to fall in love with the Moabite women and mix them up. And they all got mixed up. And as a result of that, Israel, the people of Israel, committed an uh, act of sexual immorality which ended up in idolatry and this greatly displeased the Lord. So the ways of, of God and the ways of idolatry through Balaam, you know, and uh, were, all, uh, were all mixed up, okay? You got mixed up with the people of Israel. And this is how uh, Pastor Benny Ho puts it, okay? Doctrine of Balaam basically was taking the things of God and taking the things of the world and mixing the two together, okay? They got mixed up, 
because of compromise. Now, what about the teachings of Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans seduce Christians with the teachings that, hey, you know, God created sexual activity. Therefore, you know, you can be involved in, in, in sexual pleasures and activity, and yet you can maintain your Christian identity because you have, you have, God has given you freedom, God has given you liberty, and you can do that. So therefore, you can attend pagan gatherings, you can participate in uh, acts of immorality because that will not affect your, your spirit. You are, you are safe already. Okay? Your, your spirit is already uh, safe. You are, you are going to heaven. So whatever you do in the flesh doesn't matter. So that's a deception. And in fact, uh, some of these, some variants of these beliefs still do exist through cults, and some of these cults have many, many followers. Now we can summarize these two false teachings in this way. Okay, false teachings of Balaam are basically compromises that come out of sinful association, and then the false teachings of the Nicolaitans are basically compromises, deceptions that come out of fleshly desires. Fleshly desires and sinful association. Now let's look at this a little closer. When we look at what happened to the Pergamum church in terms of compromise, it was very, very serious to Jesus. And this is one point that we need to point out. Okay, this is one aspect we need to point out and realize. The false teachings was existing in the church, yet it was ignored, yet it was not dealt with. In fact, it was very likely that the, while the false teachings were existing inside the church, they probably excused it or just explained it away. And they were not dealing with it because it was quite obvious, idolatry, immorality, yet they did not deal, deal with it. They allow it to exist and probably excused it or explain it away. Now, listen to me very carefully. This is what all of us believers are capable of doing. When we want to compromise on God's standard, to satisfy our own desires, when we want to compromise on God's standard to satisfy our own will or our own stubbornness or our own uh, enjoyment, what do we do? We explain and we excuse God's standards away. What are some examples? Hey, I didn't know it's wrong, Pastor. Hey, I didn't know it's wrong, no cell leader. Hey, we, we didn't. We didn't pray to the idols directly. We didn't. We, we, we just let them, but we didn't pray to the idols directly. What other kind of excuses do we make when we compromise? You know, this, this sexual sin uh, actually was just online only. Okay? It was cyber only. Okay? Uh, not the, the real thing. Just, we just did things on, 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 on the internet or, or, or cyber only, online. Hey, you know, some churches... Our pastors actually say that this thing is not sinful. It's actually okay, you know. Sometimes we excuse things this way. You know, this part of the Bible is not relevant because uh, that's Old Testament, but we are New Testament, all right? Now, how about this? Okay, does this sound familiar to some of you? Sometimes we compromise and we say, hey, look, this one is small sin, okay? It is not adultery, it is just a white lie. It is just gossiping. It is just speeding only. It's not, it's not adultery. All right? And we begin to explain. We begin to excuse ourselves so that we can continue on in living a lifestyle of compromising. Now church, listen carefully. Jesus did not tell us to hold on to what other people say. Okay, he doesn't, he does, he tells us not to hold on to what others say. Jesus tells us to depend fully, completely on what his word of truth says. What his word of truth says. His word is the standard. God's word is authoritative. Now I know sometimes we, we say, but you know, Pastor. Some areas are 
not clear, you know. It's, it's not clear, you know, actually. It's not clear and we want to again excuse, we want to again try to explain. But listen, when some areas that don't seem clear, then don't compromise, don't rationalize, don't blur the lines of God's standards on our own. When people come and tell me and say, that, hey, you know this area not clearly, this area not very surely, you know, and, 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 and therefore they give excuses for compromising, well, this is what I tell them. When you're not sure, when you're not clear, then apply the principle to flee from temptation. When you're not sure and you're not clear, then the principle is to stay far, far away from the boundaries of sin and temptations, right? And like what oftentimes the pastors teach us or your leaders teach you, if the line of boundary or the line of sin is here, you don't have to go so near that line. That is not the correct principle or belief. If the line is here and, and you're not sure whether you will cross it, you're not even certain whether you can resist it, the principle is not to go near the line of boundary, but to move far away from the line of boundary so that we do not fall, so that we do not compromise. And listen to this important truth. One more important truth that you need to pick up. When it comes to the area of compromise, Satan will always be very helpful. He will help you. He's the thief who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy your faith, to steal and kill and destroy my faith. So when it comes to the area of compromising on God's standards, when it comes to the area of compromising on God's word of truth, Satan himself will be super helpful. And because that is his nature, then the more we must flee, the more we must move further away from blurring the lines. If you and I are not confident, brothers and sisters, in the authority of God's Word, the Scriptures, you and I, will fall into becoming a slave to what sounds right. And I hope we've, we sense that burden for ourselves. I hope we sense that conviction for ourselves. And those of us who are leaders, I hope we sense that burden for our people. That if our people are not confident in the authority of the Scriptures, they will become a slave to what sounds right. If they're not confident of the authority of Scriptures, they'll fall into deception and compromise. And there's one more thing to point out in the verses we read. When Jesus addressed the church of Pergamum, He was addressing the entire church. He says, the church in Pergamum, which means everyone in the church, everyone in the church in, in Pergamum were held accountable for not holding on to God's standard. Now listen to this very carefully. When it comes to upholding the standards of God, when it comes to upholding the word of God's truth, listen, it is not just an individual's problem, but it is all of our responsibility. And all of us in the body of Christ, in the family of God, we are responsible for one another. And I want to say this to you, and we have heard this before, but it's an important reminder. Your sin, my sin, the sin of other people will affect not just ourselves, but it will affect the entire body of Christ. And that is why Jesus addresses the whole church. We need to look out and call out those things for each other. We need to call those things to alert each other. We need to call those things to just persuade those who are compromising and falling away from God's truth to just get out of it. We need to call those things out. So what, what, how do we apply this, this, this truth in, 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 to, to deal with some of these situations? Well, I, I put some examples here for us. There are those of us who are teaching or spreading lies, polluting the body of Christ. Well, we need to call it out and say, those are lies, those are falsehoods, deal with it. 
There are those who are living in compromise, looking for license to sin. Well, we have to, we have to appeal to them. We have to reach out to them. We have to warn them. There are those of us who say, hey, but why Tai Chi? Okay? I didn't participate. I didn't participate in this sin. I was not involved. Well, those who didn't participate but allow it to happen, it is also wrong. Then there are those of us who fail to confront with love and truth to guard the purity of our cell group, of the church, of the community. And perhaps some of us as leaders, because of fear, because of lack of confidence, because of, of fear of rejection from our members, we did not call out or confront with love and truth. So let the Lord speak to us tonight and say, hey, all these are contributing to compromises. All these are contributing to my people moving away from my word of truth. So this weekend, if that's how we are, we are living, stop. Stop compromising. Stop lying. Stop rationalizing. Stop redefining God's word to fit what we want for ourselves. Stop blurring the lines because it is self-deception. Tonight or this weekend, we come back to the word of God's truth. We want to draw the lines clearly of what's right and what's wrong and reject compromises in our Christian lives. And one key thing here for us to remember, be on the lookout for one another. So church, how can we overcome spiritual compromises in our lives? To overcome spiritual compromise in our lives, firstly, we must hold on fully to God's word of truth. We must hold on fully to God's word of truth. Secondly, to overcome spiritual compromise in our lives, not only must we hold on fully to God's word of truth, we must hold on fully to God's work of grace. We need to hold on fully to God's work of grace. Revelation 2.16, Jesus says, Repent, therefore, okay? These two words, repent, therefore, from the, from the mouth of Jesus, right here is that grace, okay? Otherwise, I'll soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Repent, therefore. Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Remember what 1 John 14 tells us about Jesus, who is the Word in the flesh. It says Jesus is full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Now, church, listen to me very, very carefully. No matter how much spiritual truths we know, no matter how much spiritual truths we hold on to in our lives, the fact of the matter is that you and I must absolutely understand and humbly acknowledge before God that we are all vulnerable. Remember the message? We are susceptible. We are vulnerable. We are all vulnerable regardless of how much truth we know. We are all vulnerable and susceptible in falling away from God. So we can't just hold on to God's truth. We hold on to God's truth, but we must hold on to God's work of grace in our lives. And the fact of the matter is, we can know great truths and we can know great mysteries of God, but this in itself is no guarantee from us falling away and compromising and sinning because we are all vulnerable and capable of self-deception despite of the truths that we know. And I always remember Pastor Lawrence Kong telling us this, this story, right? That when he was studying in the Bible seminary and, and the students there were, were studying about, they were studying to become experts in theology. And what were they doing? At the same time, they were cheating on the seminary library's photocopy machine, okay? And these were people studying to become experts in theology. So, the fact of the matter is, if we are honest with ourselves, we have all compromised in one way or another. So, what I'm trying to say here is that our confidence can, should not be just the, our ability to hold on to God's word of truth. It is important to hold on to God's word of truth, but our confidence is not in just our ability to know so much about God's truth or just to hold on 
to, to God's truth, but it is also to understand that we need to hold on to the work of God's grace in our lives. And I love this wonderful quote that says, God's grace has carried me thus far, and by His grace, I will carry on. God's grace has carried me thus far, and by His grace, I will carry on. And the Pergamum church came to a point where they were strong, they were faithful in doing God's work, they were, they were fighting spiritual warfare, they were resisting persecution. But what happened to them is then they begin to ignore the little compromises. And the little compromises came in and they, well, for whatever reason, did not deal with it or did not sense the urgency to deal with it. And that was a dangerous position to be in. When we feel that we are strong and we are great and little compromises or so-called little sins begin to come in and we say, ah, this one, never mind, KIV, don't deal with it. We, we put ourselves in a dangerous position. When we reach a place of greatness or success in our ministry and we begin to lose grip of our constant need for God's grace to check our lives, we end up in a very, very dangerous position. Let me say that again. When we come to a place of success and, and the high of, of ministry and we lose grip on our own vulnerabilities or we lose grip on our constant need for God's grace to check our lives, we put ourselves in a very, very dangerous position. And as I was writing this sermon, I, I just... I just felt humility coming over my heart. And just as you have heard oftentimes by the preachers on this very platform sharing with you, we always, there are many preachers who have shared with us admitting and, and, and appealing to us to say, please pray for those of us who preach on this platform. Because... We, we know and we understand how vulnerable we can be. And like many other preachers, and myself included, we are not so concerned or worried whether we deliver a great sermon. Of course, we want to deliver a great sermon. We are not so concerned about how things go on a preaching weekend because we, we, we know that God will help us, but we're actually concerned about our private lives on, on Mondays, okay? So when you hear Pastor Daniel or Pastor Weelong or myself or Pastor Eugene Tan or some other pastors that are preaching and acknowledging to you and say, please pray for us because we are so vulnerable, we mean it. Because we are 101% capable of compromising and falling away from God after a great week, weekend of ministry. And, and I share that with you to, to, to say that, hey, that's why we need one another. We need to pray for each other. We need to support each other. And the point here is this, whether we are pastors, whether we are leaders, whether we are members or a new Christian, we all need to hold on to God's book of grace in our lives because only God's book of grace is sufficient to help us in all situations. Now, very quickly, what are some key aspects of God's grace that we can hold on to so that we don't... We, so that we don't fall into compromise. And even if we fall into compromise, we, we can come back to God. So what are some key aspects of His grace? I put down a few things here for us. Firstly, we can have confidence. Uh, we, can, we, we can receive the, the, the grace and, and confidence in God to help us. All right, Hebrews 4, verses 15 to 16, and I love these two verses. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Verse 16 is so beautiful. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So there's confidence. Grace 
brings us to a place of confidence that we can come before the throne of God, which is a throne of grace for those times that we need help. We are falling, we are compromising. We can have confidence that we can come to help. Next, that's what we call the grace of repentance. Repentance is not a painful thing. Repentance is not a shameful thing. Repentance is grace given to us. All right, is grace given to us. And that's why Jesus says to the Pergamon church, therefore repent, because that is His grace offered to us. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He is being very patient for your sake. He does not want, listen to this, He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but He wants everyone to repent. Repent. Basically, this basically is this. No, God is very, very patient. No, He is giving us chance. All right, and and that grace. Can you see that grace there? It, that's the grace of, of offering us the chance for repentance, the grace of repentance. So we have confidence when we come before the throne of grace. We have that grace of repentance. Then God gives to us that ability. He gives us that grace to persevere. In Philippians chapter two, verses. 12 to 13, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but how much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Listen to verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His great purpose. You know, in our Christian faith, we need to persevere to the end. But the perseverance is not just something that we are confident in ourselves. And that is why God says, hey, I want you to work out your salvation. Okay, you, you persevere to the end. But understand too, it is God who works in you. That's why we need the work of God's grace in our lives. So there's confidence, there's repentance, there's perseverance. And then oftentimes we forget, but I've already mentioned it a few times tonight, Community. Community. The family of God is God's grace to us. Our spiritual family is God's precious gift of grace to us. In James 5, verses 15 to 16, it says, If you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. There's confidence as we come to the throne of grace. There's the grace that's given to us in repentance, that there's the, there's the help of God for us to persevere in our Christian faith, and there's the community of God given to us. So these are the few things that, that, that uh, the, the Lord is, has, has given to us. And, and I hope we realize through these verses and, and through these points that Jesus is indeed full of grace and truth. Listen, He's indeed full of grace and truth. God is for us. He is not against us. The, mo the modern way to put it is this. God wants you and I to make it. He wants us to make it to the end. He wants us to complete the race to the end. He wants us to make it. And that's why He gives us His word of truth. That's why He wants us to embrace His work of grace in our lives. And what's the purpose of, of, of all that? What's the purpose of God helping us? Well, it is so that at the end of the day, when we see Jesus face to face, He can reward us. He can give to us the price. He can give to us the inheritance that He has kept. For us. Revelation 2 17. And these were the closing words of Jesus to the church in Pergamum. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who, re who receives it. Now, without being too complicated in trying to explain the symbolism, well, just understand that the manna, the white stone, are essentially spiritual rewards given to us if we are victorious to the end. The manna can be seen as a symbolic 
picture of Jesus Himself. Jesus, the one who sustains us. And, and, and why do we press on? Why, why do we hang on to the end? Why, don't we, why do we reject, compromise, and, and, and go all the way to the end? Well, because we want that great reward. And Jesus is that great reward. He's our eternal reward. And when we talk about the white stone, it has basically to do with the ancient Roman custom of awarding white stones to the victors of athlete games, right? And it's, it's a symbolic picture. And this white stone is given to overcomers entrance into that victory celebration in heaven. So the reward of, of the white stone, the reward of Jesus himself, and that new name that God wants to give to us one day speaks about that glorious day in our lives when we will forever be done with, with our sinful nature. That there will come a time where our sinful nature and the, and the presence of sin will be forever removed from our lives. And I just want to say this to you. You know, sometimes I talk to my disciples, I talk to believers, and they say, Pastor, I don't understand. No, why is the Christian life so tough? Pastor, I don't understand. No, why do I need to keep struggling and, and resisting sin is so tough, is so difficult. Actually, you and I must realize this. If this weekend you are struggling against sin, if this weekend you are doing all that you can to resist compromise, actually, what we should be saying to each other is, Jiayo! Well done! Okay? You are, you are on the correct path because you're persevering. You're on the correct path because you, you, you want to run towards that prize, towards that reward. You are, you are, you are pressing on for your inheritance. Yeah, yo, well done. Hold on. Hold on. You know, and we need to say, learn to say that to each other. Not, not in a sad or gloomy or fatalistic way, but we say, hey, if, if, if we are struggling and fighting and resisting sin, we are on the right path. Because we, we want to cut through all the compromises and all the sin and all the temptations in our life so that we can fix our eyes on that great price, that great reward for our faith. And this whole aspect of inheritance and reward can be an entire teaching in itself. But let's come back to this simple statement which I put up earlier on. Understand that regardless of what we are struggling with, understand that God's grace has carried us thus far and by His grace, we will carry on. God's grace has carried us thus far and by His grace, we will carry on. And the assurance that we have is that Jesus is not against us, but He is for us. He wants to help us. And therefore, don't give up like what we we heard in, in our sermon a, a, a few weeks ago, don't give up, but hold on to His work of grace in our lives. So brothers and sisters, that's the two points that I have for you this, this weekend. How can we overcome spiritual compromise in our lives? Well, to overcome spiritual compromise in our lives, firstly, we must hold on. We must hold on and, and be and, and be. And, be, and have integrity and be truthful to ourselves, we must hold on fully to God's word of truth. Do not blur the lines. Do not compromise. Secondly, to overcome compromise, we don't just put our faith on all the truths we know, but we hold on fully. We get a grip of God's work of grace in our lives. In our lives. So I want to just share some closing thoughts as we bring this service to a close. You know, perhaps some of us, as we listen to this sermon, we say, Ayah, Pastor, I never, I'm not Pergamum, okay? I don't commit adultery. I don't commit immorality, idolatry. I'm far away from that, you know. But remember, it all begins with the small compromises. It all begins with those small or what we think are insignificant issues in our lives. And if we are shifting our standards, if we are blurring lines, then understand, 
we are compromising regardless of what type of sin it is. Remember that little compromises will lead to deadly sins. And this weekend, whether we are pastors or, or leaders or new believers, all of us need to grow in holding on to God's Word of truth. All of us need to grow in hanging and clinging on to God's Word of grace in our lives. And what I found useful personally as, as, as a pastor even is to constantly do checkups, okay, and do checkups frequently of our own spiritual lives. And, and recently, a pastor friend gave some questions to his church as they cross into the new year to self-examine their lives. And I found these questions very useful. Uh, pastor Lai Fan, my, my, my wife, and I, we used it and we passed it on to our disciples. And these are very simple questions that we can ask ourselves as an application, as a follow-up for this weekend. In our personal walk with God, family life, or church ministry, we can ask ourselves this question as, as an evaluation of ourselves. What, number one, what are some things I'm doing but would like to stop, okay? Be very honest. What are some things that you're doing you know and you know that you must stop, that you like to stop? Second question, what are some things I'm not doing? I know I should be doing. I'm not doing, but I want to start. So first one is what are the things you need to stop? Second one is what are the things you need to start? And third one is what are the things that God is doing in my life that I'm growing in, that I'm, that I'm doing and I want to continue? So these three questions are very useful for us. Constant check. Hey, this one I need to stop already. Hey, this one is supposed to get started, never start. All right. And this one, hey, great, man. I want, to, I want to do more. I want to do more. And I hope this, just these three points here can help you. Can help you. And COVID-19, all of us say, season to reset our lives. Okay, season to, to do so. But some of us, we, we have not, res, we have not res, resetted our lives or we did so, but we fell back. Well, it's still not late to do so. Come and, and honestly evaluate our lives come back to God's Word, come back to His Word of grace. And I just want to just, just share this as a, as a way of being very open to you. That as a pastor, the truth of the matter is that it's very easy to come to a point, even for my own life, that wow, externally, I look good and strong spiritually, you know. On the outside, I look great, you know. But actually inside, there are real struggles that are not known publicly and they are private and you know what's a scary thing having been a Christian for so long sometimes the public side of us is so great but the private side of us there are little things and compromises little foxes here and there that I don't deal with after a while the scary thing is that I, I realise that hey, actually these two uh, uh, they can, I can lead a double life okay I can don't deal with the private and yet the public still very good all right, and I think that, and and and, and I and I'm deceived to think that this can go on. Hey, okay, all right. Private, nobody knows. I'm safe, but public's still very good. So you live with this dichotomy, and that is the scary thing, that we can fake it, and we can keep those private parts that we are struggling with secret. Well, listen to this. Chinese has a saying, "只包不住火，只包不住火。”Paper cannot hold fire. If we have kept the private and the public part of our lives separate, and we think that we can carry on like that, 纸真的是包不住火 Paper cannot hold fire. And God is giving us time to to this weekend's message, to the messages that we've been hearing the last couple of weeks and in the weeks to come. God's grace and truth is giving us time. It is helping us. And don't come to a point where the fire destroys the paper. Don't come to that point. Today, this weekend, is the day of our salvation. It's the day of our repentance. And let me just share this in closing. You know, 
City Alight, I think some of you have heard of this ministry. It's a music ministry from a church in Castle Hill, Sydney, called St. Paul's Castle Hill. Recently, there's a song they wrote that have been making its round and we have sang it here. We have, we have sang it here in our church. And God has been using this song to minister to many believers. This song is, is called, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. And I picked up what the songwriters wrote about this song. And it's so beautiful as an illustration of all that we have been sharing tonight. And this is what they wrote about, Yet Not I, but through Christ in me. And it says, The vision of City Alight is to write songs with biblically rich lyrics and simple melodies for the Christian church to sing. And they say, We are very pleased to admit that there's nothing particularly groundbreaking in what we do. There's nothing especially new or unique or fashionable. We are not on the forefront of anything and we don't pretend to be. Our most recent hymn Yet not I, but through Christ in me, took us 12 weeks to write. We dove deep into the idea of what it meant to have Christ dwell in us. What an incredibly profound and mysterious truth. It needed time. And they said, we wrote and we rewrote the song many, many times. We struggled for every word. Because this song is an exploration of one of the greatest mysteries of the Christian faith. Having Christ in us calls together two apparently paradoxical ideas. We contend for our faith and we do it with Christ's energy. Having Christ in us does not mean that we do no more work. And neither does it mean we do it all. Rather, we contend and we contend with the energy of Jesus. Listen to this. Even our final resurrection is made possible by the gift of Christ in us. He will bring us to glory. In our weakness, He is strong. Jesus will complete the work He has begun. He Himself is within, within us, leading us home step by step. Every believer has been given this gift. It is worth singing about. When I read these words, I, I just sat there in front of my computer and I just cried and I cried and I cried. Because that is really the, the journey of our Christian life that we do all we can yet our final reliance our final confidence confidence is in Jesus who will help us to the end if we do not give up and I sense that this weekend this is what God wants to minister to us that is not we is not I, but through Christ who lives in us. And Pastor Cheryl the, and the worship team is going to lead us to sing this song. And as we sing this song, wherever we are, we are watching uh, this service, as we sing this song, let the truths of this song enter into our hearts. Let the truths of this song become our words of commitment to say, God, I'm not going to live a life of compromise. I'm going to hang on fully to your word of truth. And, and I'm not just going to rely on that, but I'm also going to hang on tightly, Lord, to your work of grace in my, in my life. So let's offer this song as a song of commitment. And as we sing this song as a song of commitment to the Lord, allow the Spirit of God, allow the presence of Jesus to come and come close to us and minister to us because He is full of grace. He is full of truth. He's not against us. He's for us and He's here to help us journey all the way to the end. Pastor Cheryl, please lead us. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is 
us no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. By my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend. words, such a beautiful song and I believe that as we were singing that, the Lord was just ministering to many of us, and just coming close to us and drawing us back to the throne of grace where His help is available for us. You know, I cannot close this weekend's service without saying a word to those of you who are watching this and you're not yet a Christian and you've been tuning in and you've been listening to the word of God and we want to thank you for doing that and perhaps you are wondering and you are saying Pastor wow there's, there's so much uncertainty in our world today there's so much pain in our world today and you are just wondering how can you even face the future and you know the Bible is very very clear that the root cause of all that we are seeing in our world today be it illnesses be it wars and, 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 and different issues that are happening now. Well, the Bible is very clear that sin is the root cause of some of these, many of these things that are happening. And you know, compromising is sin. And perhaps you're watching this and you yourself, you have actually been a victim of compromise. Someone has done something that betrayed you. Someone has done something that hurt you. And this sin of compromise have actually hurt you and you're personally affected by it. Or maybe you yourself, you have sinned, you have compromised and you have caused hurt to others and today you're just living 
with so much regrets in your life and you're wondering, can things ever become better? Can your life become new again? Well, sin has to be dealt with. And the Bible is very clear that sin has to be dealt with and our sin one day will be judged. We all have to call, come into an account to God about our sins. And, 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 and none of us, when we come before God, we are able to stand in, in our, before Him in our sins because we are all sinners and none of us are able to get rid of sin from our lives by ourselves. But you know, the good news is this. God is a God of grace. God is a God of love. And He loves you and He loves me so much that He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us so that He can pay the price of sin for us. And not only does Jesus pay the price of sin for our lives, Jesus is able to break the power the effect of sin in our lives, regardless of what we have done in our past, regardless of what we are struggling with in our present, Jesus is able to set us free from the power of sin. And you say to me, Pastor, wow, wow, I want this gift. How can I receive it? I, I want to receive this gift of salvation. I want to receive this gift of, of, of Jesus coming into my life. How can I do it? Well, I can't do it for you. God has done it for you. But I can help you this weekend. And how I'm going to help you is this. I'm going to lead you in a very, very simple prayer. And this prayer is basically designed for those of us who have never invited Jesus Christ into our life. But we know that we need Jesus. We know that we need the forgiveness of sin. We know that apart from Jesus, there's no hope. Well, this prayer is designed for us to invite Jesus to come into our lives. So wherever you are right now, why don't you just bow your heads and close your eyes. And, and if you are able to, you're in a conducive environment with no one looking around, no one disturbing you, Follow me in this prayer, word for word and line by line. And this prayer is an invitation to invite Jesus to come into your heart, to come into your life. So with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, let's follow me in this prayer, word for word and line, line by line. Say together with me, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love for me. I open my heart to you, Lord. I receive your love. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sin. Lord Jesus, I know I'm not perfect. I know that I have sinned against you. But I believe that you are able to save me. I believe that you have forgiven me. I believe, Jesus, that you can wash away all my sins. Today, I open my heart to you. I declare you are my Lord. I declare you are my Saviour. And Jesus, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And with your eyes, just continue to be closed and your head just bowed down. I want you to say a very simple prayer now by yourself, okay? I'm going to give to you the words, but I want you to say this prayer by yourself now. I'm not going to say it for you because earlier on I led you to follow me, but I want you to say these words for yourself. And they're just very, very simple words. Uh, right here and these words are God reveal yourself to me God reveal yourself to me so at the count of three when I count one, two, three I want you to say these words by yourself you, you can say it out loud or you can say it in your heart God reveal yourself to me alright here we go one two and three thank you Jesus thank you Jesus God, reveal yourself to me. God, reveal yourself to me. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You know, 
God hears our every prayer. God hears the very words that you're uttering to Him just now. And He will reveal Himself to you. Well, if you followed me in that prayer just now and, and also those, those words of prayer that I, that, I, uh, that I led you to say for yourself, well, we want to know who you are and we're going to put up uh, a URL right now on our screen. And this URL is called Connect With Us. All right, so if you prayed with me in that prayer just now, uh, whether out loud, whether in your heart and you prayed those words that I taught you to pray, okay, we want to connect with you because just like a little baby, right? You are, if, you say the, if you say those words of prayer, you are like a little spiritual baby and you need a family, you need friends to help you in the steps that you have taken. So if you have said uh, the prayer with me just now, uh, come to this link and connect with us. All right? And even if you did not follow me in that prayer, but you just somehow know that you need to connect with someone, you need to connect with a pastor, you need to connect with some Christians because you have some questions that you need us to help you with, well, feel most free and most welcome to come to this link to connect with us. All right? And praise God, you know, for all of you. I'm going to close uh, uh, this weekend's service and we're going to come back to that song that we sang earlier on during our time of Lord's Supper declaring the beauty of the name of Jesus, right? And this sermon is not to weigh us down, but this sermon is also a sermon of joy. It's a sermon of celebration that as God's people, we have His truth. As God's people, we have His, His grace to help us in our Christian work. And we depend our lives entirely on the powerful and the wonderful and the beautiful name of Jesus. So Pastor Cheryl is going to lead us in this song and then we will close in prayer. Pastor Cheryl, go ahead and lead us right now. Hallelujah. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. you are just if you are able to and it's convenient just lift up our hands to the Lord thank you Lord Father we are just so grateful we are just so thankful for your presence thank you for 
speaking us through your word this weekend and we pray that we will not just be listeners or hearers of the word, but we will be doers of the word. Thank you, Father, that regardless of where we are in our Christian lives or in our Christian journey, we have the word of your truth, we have the work of your grace that is available for us. We have the name of Jesus that is with us and we pray that this week, as we carry on in our lives, as we press on in our journey with you, Lord, we thank you that you are truly with us. Your help is available for us. And we pray that this week, as we live our lives for you, make us a blessing to everyone we meet. Make us a blessing to the people of the world that need to know you. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us. We thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And wherever you are, say together with me, Amen and Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us in this weekend's service. And we just want to bless you. And please go ahead and invite friends to join us for our online services. God bless you. And I'll see you again next week.